Well, welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're going to have our discussion on concussions. So a lot of you are familiar to this because you yourself has had a concussion or you have a family member here who's here to learn about what you're kind of going through or the symptoms that you're having. Um, so we thought we'd kind of educate you a little bit more on what's going on and why it's happening um, and kind of bring that to your family members as well so they understand kind of what you're going through. Anything to add? That sounds nope, good. No, that right. sounds mm -hmm. good. <laughs> so just a little bit of the background about concussion and some statistics. So from 2006 to 2010, which already was nine years ago, um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention had said that there's 182,000 um, TBIs, which a concussion is considered to be, um, visits that come to the emergency room just for that age group, 5 to 24 years old. And usually it's because they've been struck by an object. Um, they also identified nearly 175,000 of those ED visits were um, in the elderly because of a slip or because of a fall. So that's kind of a lot. Um, and that's when concussion wasn't really well known about or people kind of just poo-pooed it and pushed it under the rug. So those numbers have jumped tremendously. Um, and I think people are going and getting assessed much more often than they did back then as well. Because they understand that the, the seriousness, absolutely, right. without being treated. Um, so Allison on her Facebook page um, kind of listed um, the top five reasons for how you can get a concussion. Falls are number one, whether it's, you know, a trip and a fall and you just bump your head. Um, you know, sometimes it seems quite innocent, but it can result in a lot more. Uh, motor vehicle accidents, whiplash, um, essentially can lead to a concussion when your head comes forward and then back. The brain shifting inside of the skull is really what um, the concussion is. Um, unintentionally being hit by an object, uh, like we said on the first slide. Assault, so getting into a fight, being attacked by somebody. Um, and then sports related injuries. So the last picture had somebody being hit with uh, a baseball, but I think we're finding now a lot of football players, boxers, are seeing some serious effects of having concussions from their career. Absolutely. So I, I put this little slide in here just to kind of show you what can happen during a car accident, and even if it's just a quick stop short kind of um, uh, action that happens. So, you know, you're moving forward in your car. Um, as you get hit, your neck goes back into extension, so you're hitting the back of your head. So in your brain, the parts that are in the back of your head um, are mostly your visual components, it's your occipital lobe. So you're going to have some visual issues, possibly. 65% um, of our brain is um, delegated to visual, perceptual kinds of tasks. Um, so that's a large part, 65%. But then what can happen, too, as you come to a stop, then your brain is going to come forward, too. And you can either hit on the airbag, you can hit on the steering wheel, you can hit on the front windshield. So now you run the risk of hitting the front of your head. So your frontal lobe is a lot of personality. It's a lot of um, impulsivity can happen if you have damage to the front of your brain. Um, Emotion. So emotional kinds of things. So you might be a little bit more tearful. You might be a little bit more um, quick to lose your temper. Um, so now you have you know, the visual component in the back. You have the personality and um, regulation of your mood and stuff in the front of your brain. So all of those things can kind of um, compound um, when you are just in a car accident or have that sort of whiplashy event. Um, so here's what concussion is defined by both the CDC and the American Academy of Neurology. So the official definition of a concussion is it's a mild traumatic brain injury um, and it's a disruption in the normal brain function due to a blow or jolt to the head. You'll hear that in all of the definitions. It's always a blow or a jolt to the head. Um, and then the Academy of Neurology, again, a trauma induced with um, an alteration in mental status that may or may not involve a loss of, loss of consciousness. So a long time ago, a couple years ago, they graded them based on if you lost consciousness, for how long you lost consciousness. Now um, it's not that way anymore. You don't even need to lose consciousness in order to, to be classified as a concussion. And I think that's an important thing to remember because I think a lot of people assume if you have not lost consciousness, then it's not a concussion. So then they don't take action and they don't want to be treated when you know, you can still get a pretty heavy duty concussion if you have not had a uh, loss of consciousness. So what actually happens to the brain? 
This is the fanciness and the science behind it. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this, but really um, what happens is a lot of times if you say you had a concussion or you hit your head um, and you go to the emergency room, everyone wants a CAT scan or an MRI right away. So a concussion doesn't cause structural damage. It doesn't change what your amygdala looks like and it doesn't change um, you know, what your occipital lobe looks like. What it actually is, is I want you guys to think of like your brain like a bowl of spaghetti floating in jello, right? And then you have a hard shell or the bowl around all of that. Um, so what happens is as you, as we just discussed, have that whiplashy event or that reaction to the hit or the blow or the jolt to the head, is that that jello kind of shears on the bowl. So, you know, your brain is kind of shearing on the inside of your skull, which causes neuron and axonal damage. So that's just your nerve cells. They kind of get sheared against, it's like friction. Um, so what happens is those axons get bent, spindled, mutilated, <laughs> all those kinds of things. Um, and so they can't transmit the signals that they're used to doing. A lot of times, obviously, we do things and we're not even thinking about what we're doing. But that process becomes significantly slowed when we have a concussion. Um, and that's because it is an energy crisis that occurs within the brain. So just some research behind behind of what really happens. It's a metabolic dysfunction in that energy crisis. So again, because of the release of um, toxins when the neurons are damaged, um, they release a chemical and then your brain starts to slow down. So you may not have initial symptoms of a concussion until possibly up to 72 hours later. You might feel, this is what happens in car accidents all the time. People are like, nope, nope, I feel fine. I don't need to go to the hospital. A lot of time that's one because I'm an adrenaline rush because you just were in an accident, but a lot of times symptoms don't occur right away. Um, so it's a massive release of those neurotransmitters. Um, so now your cells can't talk to each other. Um, remember I said like if you want to do something, it's going from cell to cell to cell along that axon um, and telling the other cells what to do. So now there's a disruption. Um, and it may require, like I said, days um, to, for those nerve cells to return. Many people recover in seven to 10 days. If you're lasting longer into weeks and months, then it's more of a post-concussive syndrome. It's not just a regular concussion. Um, so the nerve cell is, is extremely vulnerable during this time frame, during the 72 hours, and especially even up to two weeks. If you get hit in the head again, um, second impact syndrome, um, you're just that far behind. And it's actually even dangerous and sometimes can be life-threatening if you get that second impact. So think about all of our, uh, you know, football players or boxers who repeatedly get um, hit in the head or have those blows to the head. Um, it's just over and over and over again of this cascade kind of happening. Okay. Yep. Um, so Allison, another post that she put on is that there's four kinds of categories um, of symptoms that can happen with concussion. Uh, the first is thinking or remembering. Um, so having trouble concentrating, having trouble remembering even little things, your grocery list, if you made a phone call, um, processing, you know, any kind of information. Uh, physical symptoms, so headaches, neck pain, balance difficulties. Headaches are a big one, and I think a lot of times people think, oh, I just hit my head, I have a headache, but headaches are a sign of a concussion. Um, the emotional side that we talked about a little bit earlier, the sadness, irritability, anxiety. Anxiety can be a big part of the concussion. And sleep disturbances. So whether you're having difficulty falling asleep or having difficulty staying asleep uh, plays a big part in the concussion as well. So again, a little bit more research, um, going back to those visual symptoms, a lot of people don't realize that they are having visual symptoms. 82% um, of this sample that um, this study did showed that there was some sort of eye-related um, problems noted after a concussion. So either their eyes weren't coming together um, well, so when things were coming at them, they would have like double or blurred vision. Um, you, they were having trouble reading, so a saccadic kind of dysfunction where their eyes weren't moving across either horizontally or up and down, um, so that would cause problems. Um, and then another study also now identifies kind of what we just said, um, that prolonged symptoms of physical cognitive, and then those psychosocial kinds of things, those emotional things that impact overall like who you are, they impact life. Um, so 
going back to school, going back to your job, doing things around the house, all of those things that used to be so easy, getting yourself ready, getting in and out of the shower, that is no longer something that's um, easy for you because you're trying to maintain your balance, you're trying to not see double, you're trying to you know, do it as quickly as you were before, now you're frustrated because you can't do it as quickly as you did before, that increases your anxiety level. It's, it's very cyclical um, in those kinds of things and overall it changes kind of who you are um, and how you're acting within your role as mother, as worker, as wife, as husband, that sort of thing. So this is just a nice little chart um, summarizing the kinds of symptoms um, that you can have um, broken down into those physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms. So um, pretty much we've touched on all of these things, but also some things that can happen is because of the dizziness, because of that feeling of movement that you get. There's a lot of nausea, um, a lot of um, clumsiness. You might reach for an object and because of a depth perception issue or just you're not coordinated and quick as you used to be. You might be knocking things over. You might be holding an object while you're walking um, and then drop it because you're not paying attention. You're not able to do, we call it dual tasking. Um, so you're not able to kind of do, you can't chew gum and walk a straight line. Right? A lot of people use that analogy. Um, but it's very true sometimes of people who have had a concussion. Um, tinnitus, do you want to touch on that maybe a little bit? Tinnitus or ringing in the ear um, can come from a couple of different things. But essentially what's happening is the nerve in your ear is getting irritated, whether it's from an insult, like it's been hit and damaged, or if it's coming from a postural issue. Both can be linked to a concussion. If you've had a whiplash syndrome because of the concussion, your neck muscles are going to get really tight. It's a protective mechanism that the body goes through. So if that happens and your head starts to come a little forward in that protective state, it can also pinch down on that nerve and cause the ringing in the ear. So it can come from either that insult to the nerve itself or from a postural aspect. And I think the other ones we'll either touch upon or we already have at least a little bit. Um, so the physical symptoms and how physical therapy can help. I'll let Allison kind of take that over. So the physical symptoms, um, we'll kind of go off these pictures a little bit. Uh, let's start with the headaches. Start at the top, work our way down. So headaches, either from the bump to the head and actually hurting the head or if it's coming from the neck. Um, we do a lot of soft tissue work. We're working on neck range of motion. We're working on those muscles to relieve some of the tension in there. Um, and a lot of headaches do come from the neck, the way the muscles are lining up and where those nerves enter the brain um, and how they get pinched with those neck muscles um, are triggering headaches. Um, the balance, uh, again, when you kind of hit the brain in those two areas, it's going to kind of disturb your balance center. So we're retraining you how to stand on one leg, how to walk and turn your head so that when somebody calls your name when you're walking down the street, you don't lose your balance. We practice stepping over objects, doing things with our eyes closed. All of the different components of our balance system um, can get impaired and we're working on those in PT. Because again, too, the cerebellum, which is our balance center, right. is also located <clears throat> in the back of the brain, kind of right under that occipital lobe. So if you're getting that whiplash where you're hitting the back of your head or if you fell and slipped on ice and hit the back of your head, um, that's also going to be an area that's impacted. So that's why PT really tries to work on those balance issues And the good thing well. is, is this is all stuff that can be retrained. You know, it's not because you had this injury, you're always going to have this deficit. You just need a little help to kind of retrain the brain, how it used to function beforehand, and kind of get those signals to fire the way they were before they were disturbed in that sequence that you had talked about. Um, I think that's most of the physical stuff, the headaches, the neck pain, the balance. And that's just the vertigo. That oh, and the vertigo. Yeah. Yes, I did miss that one. So vertigo can be a couple of different things. Either a sense of unsteadiness while you're standing still, almost like if you're on a boat and you kind of feel like you're swaying back and forth. Or the other big one um, is when the crystals in your ears, which I'm sure many of you of the doctors have talked about crystals in your ears if you've ever had a concussion, they kind of come out of place. When those crystals pop out of place, things will move around you. We have two different approaches to managing those different kinds of vertigo. 
Um, but again, we assess both of those in PT and we'll kind of get you back from either of those scenarios. But they are two different kinds of vertigo, so just be mindful of your symptoms. It does help if you're kind of aware if you feel you're moving or if things are moving around you. Is, that, is vertigo when everything moves around you? Or? Well, that's one kind. Okay. So there's one that comes from the inner ear where the crystals that are in there that help maintain your balance they come out of place because you've had a hit to the head or you've been jolted and they just kind of pop out of place. Mm -hmm. um, and then the things move around you. Now the other kind of vertigo, you don't feel like things are moving back and forth. You feel like you're standing on something wobbly. That's more brain related. But we treat both. Um, so like I had mentioned a little bit earlier, um, a lot of people don't even know that a concussion can impact your vision. Um, so again, it's kind of that um, axonal damage that you have um, to those nerve cells that are um, making connections in the brain. So um, things that can also happen, though, that I didn't mention um, is eye health issues. So with an injury, um, your lens, which is right in front of your um, eyeball, can actually shift. Um, you could get a retinal tear, so you might actually see flashes of lights. Um, you can, you know, you might also have glaucoma or cataracts and can kind of get a little bit exacerbated if you're having other issues with the eye. Um, and then you can also, unfortunately, get an optic nerve lesion. So the optic nerve is the nerve that comes out of your eyeball and goes into the back of your head. Um, I did work with an optometrist who actually had um, someone, it was actually severed right where they cross, so wound up with total blindness. Um, so those are things, obviously, severe, severe injuries, but um, given the right conditions, those things can kind of happen. So those are all eye health issues that can happen, which an ophthalmologist or an optometrist can kind of um, dig out. Um, for you, especially if you're having flashes. If you're having flashes, that's pretty indicative of a retinal tear, so you want to get that um, taken care of pretty easily. But there's also changes that can happen um, in your acuity, so that's your 20-20-ness. Sometimes that can change to, I've seen up to at least 2200. Um, so that clarity is a little bit off. Um, how your eyes are moving together, which I kind of mentioned before, are you seeing um, double, are you able to read without skipping your lines and going off the page, um, and how you're perceiving your environment. So that falls into that visual perceptual um, category. So maybe now you can't do a puzzle because you can't figure out how shapes fit together, um, or you might just be having some issues um, with visual clutter. Um, if you have a white object on, a, on your sheets, which also happen to be white, maybe you can't differentiate that because it's white on white. So um, there's some of those issues that can also happen. The main question that we ask when we do an evaluation is, um, have you had a concussion before? A lot of times we hear, well, not a diagnosed one. <laughs> or a, a story, too, where they're like, well, I hit my head pretty bad. I had a headache for a couple of days, and I didn't really get treated for it because it went away. Um, if you have a history of migraines, so you already kind of have a neurological um, issue that's occurring um, by having migraine headaches, or if you've had a learning disability, so if you always kind of had trouble in school, um, either with reading, with dyslexia, um, math issues, um, that's kind of going to put you behind the eight ball when we start the recovery process. Um, or if you had a malalignment of your eyes um, where you required surgery, um, so if you have one of those eyes that drifts out or drifts in and they fix that cosmetically um, when you were a child, that's also going to um, cause a little bit longer of a recovery rate. I've worked with a couple people who um, had had the surgery and then after a concussion the eye was kind of out of alignment again just because it's weaker to begin with. So just kind of things to keep in mind if you do get a concussion and you have any of those things. So in terms of OT, kind of the things that we work on are any kind of eye movement thing. So we work on that scanning, that reading. Um, a lot of times with our students, we look at board to table things. Kids are in the classroom all the time. They look at the whiteboard, which is now high contrast because everything is on a computer screen with the touch that the uh, teachers use. Um, and so they're looking far. Their um, lens relaxes. Um, their eyes fall apart. Now they have to write either on their 
um, computer screen, their tablet, and their notebook. So now their eyes are coming uh, close um, and crossing, um, and their lens constricts a little bit. So that constant back and forth of their eyes changing um, makes for some, some difficulty in the classroom. So we work on kind of remediating that a little bit, habituating that, uh, that a little bit. A lot of times we avoid things that make us symptomatic. So um, you may not be reading anymore, you may not be on your phone anymore, or you've significantly decreased that time. Um, so you avoid it. And that's kind of why you need therapy, because we present that um, to you uh, within a certain protocol. You know, don't be symptomatic. Don't push yourself so that you're symptomatic for days after you come to us for therapy. That shouldn't be how it is. So we're constantly asking you, how are your symptoms? How are you feeling? Um, so that we can rate what we're giving you. If you're feeling good, then we'll kind of progress you a little bit. Um, if you're not feeling so good, then we'll back off a little bit. But you have to be honest with your symptoms. Uh, we look at some visual perceptual retraining. We look at some um, strategies either for field loss or for functional activities. So um, we'll take the student example again. If they're not able to look at the board and then take notes again, we'll look at some um, accommodations that can be done in the classroom, either recording a class or doing dragon, um, or there's a live scribe pen where you actually take notes and it records the lecture. Um, so there's not lots of new things that are coming about um, that can help the student, but we'll look at some strategies for adapting that. Um, we look at memory things, so we'll give you strategies for remembering. Um, a lot of people use strategies already, you don't even know you have it. We're in a wonderful age right now where we have phones that have apps with list makers and alarms and reminders and calendars right at our fingertips. So um, it's, it's kind of nice that all of that is right there. But we'll teach you how to use those if you're unfamiliar with those kinds of um, technologies. Um, we're the ones who look at return to learn um, protocols for the student and for adults it's return to work. You know, we follow the same uh, procedures um, and it's symptom based of course. Uh, we look at working memory, so that's problem solving, those higher level cognitive thoughts, um, like how to plan. So if you need to run four errands in a day and two are across town, one's really close to home, then we kind of look at can you do that task or are you having trouble with that and how can we make that work for you. And then independent activities of daily living, like can you do your laundry, can you drive, can you do your med management, those kinds of things. So that's kind of what OT in a nutshell is working with you and we'll kind of give you different tests to kind of see what you're good at and we'll weed out the things that you're not so great at. This was a nice little tip uh, sheet that I found online um, and it's kind of for the families. So it, it was uh, called 10 things my doctor didn't tell me after my traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so you can't say that we didn't tell you. Um, so really it's kind of things that we've already talked about. But no concussions, traumatic brain injuries are the same. So Allison could have a concussion, I could have a concussion. Same mechanism of injury. So we could both fall on ice, hit the backs of our heads. She's going to present totally different than I am. Um, so this, and she may recover and I may take six months to recover um, or vice versa. So um, everyone's going to recover different. Um, how much that person is going to recover is going to be different. Um, and, you know, some people respond better to medication, so either for um, pain relief or symptom reduction. Um, there's lots of groups out there to help with traumatic brain injury survivors and for the caregivers. Um, a really good one is the Brain Injury Association of America. So you can look that up online. Um, and they will give you, it's by state, and then they can give you local support groups um, for yourself or for your family. There's some very common deficits after a concussion, so we kind of just talked about all of those. Um, the big one that we didn't really talk about a lot is anxiety, and I think that's very symptom related. You get a symptom, you get nervous, you avoid doing that task, and the angst just kind of builds up and over and over again. I'm not going to do that because it's going to give me a headache or it's going to make me nauseous or I think I'm going to fall over. So um, I think it's good for families to understand that anxiety buildup that can occur. And I think anxiety is different for everybody as well. So just kind of being nervous about things is just one form of anxiety. You know, avoiding tasks um, is another form of anxiety. Just because you, like you said, you don't want to do it anymore, so you just don't do it. And that's because of an underlying anxious issue. 
Um, and then, of course, as you start to lose those roles, if symptoms last a little bit longer, then kind of a depression sets in. Or, and again, depression also looks very different in people. So that lack of initiating tasks, that lack of motivation, um, just not wanting to go out of the house, those are all kinds of leading up to uh, what could be a, a diagnosed depression. Um, but again, mood is significantly impacted um, by all of these things that are going on. Um, there's no time threshold for recovery. You break a bone, six to eight weeks, you're healed and you're walking again or you're using your arm again or you have surgery, shoulder surgery, you know, there might be a little bit of time, but your brain is different. And like Allison said um, previously, um, your brain is plastic and it's constantly changing. And we now have learned um, through research that um, you can continue to get better. Um, so again, there's no time frame. Um, previously it was if you don't get better in two years, you're done. Um, that's not really true anymore. That's a myth. So as long as you keep challenging and keep um, progressing yourself, then you can make changes. And you may not be the person who you were before, but you may still be functional, right? So you might not be able to um, drive. We'll use that as a, a severe example. But if you can get yourself on the bus, or you can call an Uber for someone to get you there, you're still functional, you're still in you know, the community. So there's different ways of succeeding. You may not do it like you did before, um, but you definitely can still do tasks that you love and enjoy. Um, look at some alternative approaches. I'll let Allison talk about a couple of things here, but you know, look at medication, of course, but exercising um, within a protocol. Um, Exercising makes you feel good. It releases endorphins. Then all of a sudden you feel a little bit better. You feel like you can do a little bit more. Um, so those are natural things that you can look at. Um, look at yoga. Look at mindfulness meditation. Um, we're actually having next month, um, the next workshop is on that. Yep. So keep in mind, it's a brain injury, and it's very hard to turn off the brain to let it heal completely. So mindfulness is a way to almost slow down the brain and give that brain some time to heal. Uh, and it's a good way to kind of just decompress um, and really let things go back to the way we were. We're always on overdrive. You know, we want to get things done today so that we can do more tomorrow. We don't want to rest. We just want to keep going. You know, long gone are the days where the weekends you didn't work at all. You're always catching up on stuff. But I think by incorporating mindfulness into your day and really taking a little bit of time to just unwind can really be an asset. Um, to the, the brain healing. Um, you know, if you're into essential oils and that works for you, then aromatherapy might work. Um, take a look at diet and nutrition. Um, if your um, caffeine intake, alcohol intake, sugar intake all impact how our brain performs. Um, so if any of those are in an abundance, then maybe that could be impacting too, how your brain heals a little bit. Um, beware of overstimulation going out to a restaurant, being in, you know, if your grandchildren are in a swim meet, maybe going to their swim meet is not the best place to be because of the water splashing and the buzzers going off and, and all the movement in the water. Um, so you kind of want to, I always tell people, um, especially the first week or two that they come to me, they're like, well, I have a such and such event this weekend. And I was like, all right, if you want to try and go, that's fine, but always have an out. So either have a ride where you can leave or um, say that you're, give yourself a time limit. I'm just gonna stay for 20 minutes and I'm not gonna um, you know, do the three hour event. Pace yourself. Um, I think another big one is the grocery store and mm -hmm. people don't realize it. Absolutely. One, you're scanning, so you're constantly looking at the shelves to find an object that you're looking for. People are coming at you, people are going around you, you're getting different visual fields the whole time you're at the grocery store. You have to concentrate to remember the list that you have and you're kind of always taking uh, like a survey of your area so the brain is very overloaded when you're at the grocery store. The fluorescent lights that are overhead, the tile floor that's reflecting the fluorescent lights, it's just a lot of extra stuff yep. um, that you want to take into consideration in your environment. Um, again, the tolerance for all of that to an injured brain is a lot less than what we're used to. We are all connected to our phone, to social media, to YouTube, to video games, to television. So, um, you know, screen time, it's a bright light that's coming at us, so that's going to be impactful as well. So there's different things that we can do to accommodate that. You can decrease your um, 
screen brightness. You can use filters over that. And again, you want to kind of limit your time um, that you're on those. Um, and then once you've reached the het max, um, that's when you start to get irritable. Because imagine yourself, if any of you before this event have ever had like a concussion, uh, a headache or a migraine, you know how grumpy you can get, right? It's just you're in pain, everything's not um, good. You might have visual things with a migraine. So this is things that people with concussions have all the time. So you just want to take that into consideration that if a family member who has a concussion is a little grumpy, they have a right to be a little grumpy sometimes just because they've been dealing this. We take, uh, we have a migraine, we take some ibuprofen, we maybe take a nap for an hour or so, we wake up, we're good to go. Um, not the case with someone who's had a concussion for five weeks, three months. And keep in mind, if you have a migraine, you take your medicine, you go take a nap. If you have a concussion, sometimes you have difficulty falling asleep, so now you can't go and take that nap. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, so give your brain that downtime it needs to recover, cause, because actually when you're sleeping, it is releasing healing neurotransmitters that can actually heal the brain a little bit. So sleeping is an okay thing. Um, balance pushing yourself and allowing downtime. So with therapy, like I said, we're going to push you to that healthy limit, and then we'll back off. A lot of times if you're used to going, 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 and, you know, being the mom who takes care of the kids, who does the grocery shopping, who works a full-time job, if you're that person, um, you're just going to keep pushing yourself. But you need to allow that rest break. Um, so um, there is a pacing point system that you can use where you take each task that you do during the day and you give it a value of zero to five. You should be only doing 20 points a day. So if it, you getting ready in the morning is severely exhausting, gets you dizziness and nausea, uh, gets you dizzy and gives you nausea, um, that's probably gonna be a five. So already you're at a five and all you did was get dressed and take a shower. Um, now you have to make breakfast for either yourself, your family, your kids. Um, that might be a four. So already it's nine o'clock and you're at nine out of your 20 points. So I think it's just a good way of making yourself aware of what activities um, give you those symptoms and then how many of those activities you can do during the day. You're not going to go to three doctor's appointments in one day. You know? And if you know that um, mornings are better for you or afternoons are better for you, Schedule your routine around those better times for yourself. Physical fatigue, again, it takes a lot to heal the brain, so you're going to be tired. And I think we've kind of talked about that a little bit, too. Um, unfortunately, people can't see that you have a concussion, right? If you are in a car accident and you have a neck brace on or you broke a leg, um, people can kind of see that you're on crutches and that you're having some symptoms. Um, when you have a concussion, it's not always visible, and you might just be feeling off, you're having trouble word finding, you're forgetting things, you're a little bit more cranky than normal, that they can kind of get a gist for, but if you're having a headache, they're not necessarily going to know you're having a headache. So, um, and people are going to judge you a little bit on your symptoms. They'll think, why aren't you better yet? Um, it's just a headache, um, those kinds of things. And, and unfortunately, as a person with a concussion, you're going to hear that a lot, and you kind of just have to either educate people so that they know or you just kind of have to say, yep, I'm not better yet, but I'm getting better every day. I'm, these are the things that I'm doing to make myself better, and um, I'll get there some, at some point. And then accepting the new normal. Um, there is kind of like a grieving process that happens when either yourself or a loved one has um, a concussion. For yourself, you know, if you're used to going 110% and now you're only at 75%, that's a huge loss of you. You know, that's like 30% of you that is not performing to how you want it to perform. So, again, the sooner you can kind of say, all right, this is how I need to work for now, um, and then modify and adjust, um, that can definitely be helpful in that process as you start to get better. Look at it kind of as a, a restarting opportunity. Sometimes, like Allison just said, we're in a go, go, go society where we're working too much. So um, maybe this is your time to kind of reset that. Return to play. Um, so return to play is kind of like Alicia talked with the return to learn. There are a certain set of criteria and there are stages in order to get um, back to a sport, again, back to work. We can kind of adapt it for all different kinds of situations. Um, to give you the basis of it, it's, 
it's different stages and you cannot advance to the next stage until you are completely symptom free with activity in the prior stage. So there's certain things that you have to do in stage one. If you can do all of those activities in stage one and not get symptomatic, no headache, no nausea, no balance issues, then we advance you to stage two. Uh, but we'll see kids going back to sports, especially in high school when they're still symptomatic. In, even in that last stage, they're still getting a little dizzy, but they go back to their sports, which really delays the healing process. And I think if we took some time to really think about getting back to that sport, getting back to work, you would get back a lot quicker if we were strict with these stages. And we really did not advance people to the next set of activities without them being symptomatic. Um, I broke down uh, the return oh. to learn guidelines a little bit better. So like for phase one, things that we're looking at for you to return. The first stage is you're at home, you're not going out, you're not going to school yet, or you're not going to work. These are just some of the things um, that we're avoiding or that we're making you rest for doing. Um, if, Like Allison said, if you're symptom free, then you start phase two. If you're not for 24 hours, then we keep going with this uh, agenda. Um, so. Phase two, you're still at home, you're still not at work, you're still not driving, um, but you can do a little bit more. You're trying to tolerate kind of some thinking for 30 to 60 minutes without getting too crazy um, in terms of, of work. Phase three, you might go back now for a partial or a full day of work or school, but you're still going to need maximum amount of accommodations. So you may not be testing. Um, but maybe instead of writing down your answers, um, the teacher might give you a, a verbal test um, just to kind of see if you can start to, to think a little bit more. So the accommodations are there. You might um, not be able to eat in the cafeteria or um, you might have to eat in the nurse's office. Um, you might have to leave class a little bit early before the bell rings um, versus transitioning with the whole hallway. Again, talking more about the school environment, but same thing for work. If you're working in a cubicle setting, not necessarily the best place for you to be. Um, maybe you would have to go into an office um, or a quieter environment or work from home for a little bit at a time. Stage four is a full day, um, but still 50% uh, accommodations. Um, still no gym, um, allowing breaks when, when they need it. Um, this is the interesting part. Uh, phase five, they can do a full day with minimal accommodations, and now they can restart return, return to play. We're such a sport-oriented society that um, return to play starts before return to learn is even thought about. They start the return to play, and then they're like, oh, you're still having trouble in school with a chalkboard, or you can't read for more than five minutes, and we kind of do it backwards. Um, but this, ideally, is the way that it really should be done. They should really be already tolerating a full day um, without a lot of assistance right. before they start running on a treadmill. Right. Um, and then here's full recovery. Whoop! We're almost done. Um, here's full recovery. Um, you're back to normal home routines, uh, normal social activities, um, and a normal course, uh, course load. And you're kind of feeling 95 to 100% better. On the return to play, um, a lot of it's based on heart rate. Can we get your heart rate up to a certain beat per minute without you getting symptomatic? So um, different kinds of activities, and we can do it sports specific, um, but it's cardio, strength training, and we're monitoring uh, what your heart rate is and how symptomatic you are getting. Right, and for everybody it's a little bit different. Um, a few years ago I also had a concussion, so I kind of can relate a little bit. Um, to what our clients are going through, and that was my biggest block, was the return to play. Um, I jogged in my free time, and um, it would be, I would hit that wall every time at like five minutes. I would get a headache every time. Um, but then eventually, you know, I would check my heart rate, and then I would stop and slow down, and then I finally got myself over that hump. So again, it's different for everybody when you're getting your symptoms, if it's more um, cognitive, if it's more physical, if it's more uh, visual, but um, that's why you come and see us, and we can kind of narrow that down for you. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> that was a lot. Absolutely, yeah. We've seen people, Jill, how long was she out? Mm -hmm. Years, mm -hmm. probably close to that. I mean, she was in college when she first got her concussion, and there's definitely stuff we can work on. And there are people who randomly, they have symptoms that return for no known reason. Um, but yes, we can still work on it. There is still 
things that we can do to help the recovery. So our brain um, likes to cheat and it likes to do things as easy as possible. It doesn't like a challenge. It wants to be uh, as efficient but as fast um, in, doing, in doing things. So um, as we get older, sometimes symptoms may start also to return. Um, because we could compensate a little bit better while we were younger and concussed and having symptoms, but as we get older, it's a little bit harder to um, do those uh, accommodations or those compensatory tasks. So sometimes you do. You need to come back to therapy a little bit. We'll remind you of things, or we'll try things a little bit different. Um, that's what's great about you know PT and OT. That's what we're we're meant to do. We're meant to kind of delve down into the activity that you're doing, break it down, see where exactly you're having problems and to things that you may not even know you're having issues with. Right. So if you kind of break down treatment and what we do, so when we're treating children, I'll use that as an example because you said you use kind of in the kids section. So developmentally, we give kids toys so that they progress through a stage and a skill that they're lacking. Um, so we use certain activities like word searches or where's Waldo or those kinds of things because they build on certain skills. Um, figure ground, I'll be technical here for a little bit, but you know, your eye movement, your saccade. So what you're looking at when you have a concussion is you had those skills, now you've had that shearing of those nerve cells and now you kind of lost that skill. So we need to find it again and kind of give you those activities. So a lot of times, um, you know, we always make it patient specific, but a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm doing my games in therapy. But um, it's because the games are developed to work on those skills. Um, so I wouldn't stop doing them necessarily, but I don't know if those activities that you're doing are going to work on the linguistic kinds of things that you're mentioning and having trouble with. So word finding can be either you can't find uh, the word that you want to say because it's not coming out of your brain section where it's supposed to, or it could be an attention thing as well. Like if you're trying to say a sentence and then all of a sudden, yeah, you're kind of, like I said before, walking, uh, chewing gum and walking a straight line. It's kind of hard for you to get that all, especially in a loud environment or if conversations when we're with our girlfriends, it's never one person talking to us, right? It's always like a group conversation where you're kind of going back and forth and you're trying to attend to one person and then think about what you're going to say next and then you kind of lose it and then... So did you have speech therapy? So speech therapy sometimes can also help. Well, that's, that's one of the aspects that they have within their scope is that they work on that word finding. They give you compensatory strategies. Um, so if you can't think of a word necessarily right off the get-go, if you describe the word, you kind of go around what you're trying to say. People are very helpful in filling in that word for you um, when you're having a conversation because of that lull they can tell that you're having trouble. People want to be helpful, so they'll kind of give it to you. Um, but that can be frustrating, too, because you want to come up with a word on your own. So there's different techniques, too, that speech therapists can also give you. So that might be another option um, if it's more definitely word-based versus an attention thing. If it's an attention thing, then OT can kind of work on that, too. Four years ago, whacked the back of my head, did a pretty good one, woke up on the top of a mountain, didn't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Um, so I was, came home, did the rehab, all that kind of stuff, symptom free, about nine months later, passenger driving down Kelly Drive, Boathouse Row, looking side to side and snap. I'm sick as a dog, vestibular issues, I, my eyes have never been the same since. How often do you see that happen? That's kind of what happened to Jill. Yeah. 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 Again, maybe just the environment because it was so overstimulating yep. um, could have just been that trigger. Um, also, if you never really got checked out, did you ever have like a vision screen or a vision oh, yeah. exam after? Mm -hmm. By what kind of eye doctor? Hmm. Uh, I went to Reading. Okay. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Do you remember if it was an ophthalmologist or an optometrist or a neuro? Op neuro. It was a neuro. Okay. I've seen okay. two neuros. Okay. I've seen one down in Reading and one also at Good Shepherd. Okay. 
Um, so again, you want to make sure that you're getting that comprehensive kind of eye exam, that they're not just looking at the retinal tear, the you know, cataracts, glaucoma, all those yes. kinds so of things. So they were checking so whether your eyes could come together or... or divergence yep, all the kind, kind of good stuff, stuff. yeah. Tons, tons of this. After the second incident or after the first incident? After the second one. And what'd they find? Anything? Hmm. Lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> so then did you ever have vision therapy? Did I you have did. it at Echo I Shepherd? Went, I went through about three months of vision therapy. Okay. Um, On a computer screen or in 3D real life? All, both. Okay. Yep. Still and you're having still having symptoms? symptoms? Did they give you stuff to be working on? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. And still it. nothing. I mean, so my, the reason I have a concussion, I had a concussion, is I'm a mountain biker. Okay. Throwing myself off of things stupidly. <laughs> so that, that's like, that's my biggest thing is the, my visual acuity, my vestibular, my balance is just not there. Um, again, it's that 70%. When I was there, I was 100%. Now I'm about 70%. I, I live with it, and I accommodate. But um, there's always that little bit of vision issue and balance issue. I know we have seen a lot of times where people will go through even a long bout of PT and OT, and sometimes you just need time off mm -hmm. and then to kind of pick it up again and that can go on for a couple different cycles yeah. so this is four years that so far this is the the best i've felt in four years um, and that's just time yeah absolutely and you're still getting better right right so um getting there yeah, yeah. It's so frustrating, right? I don't, I don't, I don't get nauseous like I used to. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Are you back to riding bike? <laughs> about a week afterwards, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, 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 yes. So Are you what, well wearing a helmet? Oof, broke it all sorts of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, always wear a helmet. And you want to remember, after you have that initial hit on a helmet, throw the helmet out. Yep. It's no good anymore, right. even if you didn't crack it or any of that kind of stuff. So um, yeah. it's a once and done deal once you hit your head in a helmet. So, Is that um, the helmet you were going to let me use today? <laughs> no, that's the one I used today. <laughs> <laughs> that, one, that one's good. So. But to answer the question, yes, we do see that. We see people years out of a concussion, and sometimes you just need to go back to therapy for a little bit to kind of have a refresher. And, you know, sometimes it's different things, too. Sometimes what worked the first time isn't what you need to do the second time. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes people get stuck. Well, I remember what they told me to do at home. I remember all my exercises. I'm just going to do it on my own. Um, but sometimes you do need to go back and... And so now more. that you've developed maybe one eye skill and you're good at it, now maybe you can advance it to a, a more challenging eye skill. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why it is always kind of good to keep on it. Um, you know, if you're good at A, now let's move you to B, you know, and then kind of keep progressing it a little bit. So. And you and I have talked about that. You're a 125% a day kind of person, you know, that, that Allison was talking about. So um, even you working at 90%, you still don't feel back to normal, right, if, if that were the case. So you do have to set those, those milestones and those targets, and they can't be up here. I always say to my new patients, concussion rehab is like this, because you start to feel good, you overdo it, and then you're back down here with your symptoms. And then you kind of, it's kind of the two step forward, one step back kind of technique, but it's good as long as you keep climbing um, that you're, you are improving, but a lot of times we do just really tend to overdo it because we're feeling good and then, yep. and then we pay the price a little bit. So that pacing is definitely, definitely helpful. Good. I do tell patients to always be aware of it, mm -hmm. that it may trigger it. It's not one of those things where every single time you get on a plane, yes, it's going to trigger it but you're always more susceptible to being triggered.
Think about something. your environment, first of all, in an airport. It's not a quiet place, right? So you're visually stimulated before you even get on the plane. There's a pressure change, so it's constantly regulating, you know, your vestibular system. Yeah. There's that weird thing when you're in a plane, you're going 500 miles an hour, but you don't feel like you're moving. Mm -hmm. So your vestibular system is getting that kind of wacky dichotomy between what you're visually seeing and what you're actually feeling within your body. So I always tell fresh concussions, especially like, oh, I have a trip. We might want to run that by your doctor just to get clearance for it. Um, but with you being out a while, um, maybe the more you go down to Georgia, maybe you'll get less symptomatic. But yeah, and a lot of that is just because of the input that you're getting. So the pressure change is huge because it is changing the pressure on the brain. But that visual input of things moving past you when you're looking out the window, but you are sitting still, all of the that That's feedback, the right? All of that feedback <laughs> is what causes it, yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of the opposite. Like when you're nauseous in a car, people say, find something out the window to focus on. In a plane, it's a whole different perception. Yeah. So something to be aware of. All right, well, thank you for coming. And uh, like I said, next month we're having mindfulness. So a good piggyback onto the concussion seminar. All right. Thank